Yeah, hello, welcome to Football Untold, the podcast that explores the darker side of the beautiful game. Thanks for checking us out. Now, in each episode of this new podcast, we're hearing from professional football players, past and present, who are sharing their stories of problem gambling, what that means to them, how it impacted their lives, and how they found a way through it. They're doing it here to shine a light on the issue and to encourage people who are struggling with their own problems to come forward and get support. My name's Mick Coyle, a journalist with more than 20 years' experience and specialising in opening up the mental health conversation in a way that's hopefully accessible and understandable. I'll be guiding you through these conversations on Football Untold, alongside some famous names and faces. Don't forget, throughout, you can get involved on social media using the hashtag Football Untold and subscribe to the series to get every episode as soon as it is is released now we've got our first guest on football untold is a player who is maybe best known for helping guide burnley to the premier league but he also enjoyed spells at leeds preston blackpool york northampton and watford he's a former chair of the pfa and has used his experience of depression and suicidal thoughts to bring these sorts of conversations to people who maybe wouldn't normally hear it please welcome clark carlisle hello sir hello mick how are you yeah very good thank you we should say as well we're not alone in the studio uh we have got uh, former wales international simon howarth is with us so good to see you good to see you mick good to uh, see you clark and we've got uh, Sam Wedgbury with us, who's uh, still applying his trade as well uh, at the age of 34. Sam, good to see you as well. Good to see you all. Thanks for having me. We've got a lot to talk about. This is the first episode, so we almost want to set the tone of what we're going to talk about, what Football Untold is going to be about. Um, Sam, I'm going to come to you first, actually, before we touch on, on Clark's story, because Football Untold is about maybe shining a light on a side of the game that we don't see. And there's a, we're going to pick gambling for the first series because we feel like it's a topic which both has a story to tell, tell that's untold, but also that it it will impact on other people's lives outside of the game, people who've followed the game, fan supporters, as well as those who are still playing or involved in the game at the moment. Yeah, um, that's the idea, to raise some awareness and just to tell the story of, of gambling in football. And uh, you'll get lots of different uh, stories. No no gambling addiction is the same. So hopefully somebody out there will recognise that. And as I said, the, the, the main priority is to raise some awareness with it. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to be having almost a, a five-a-side team, if you like, of, of players sharing their stories, uh, stories that they've never spoken about before, uh, some stories that they want to hope will inspire other people to reach out and get support. We'll be hearing Sai's story. We'll be hearing Sam's story as well. So make sure you are subscribed to Football Untold. Uh, Clark Carlisle, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you've been one of these trailblazers of footballers who've spoken about mental health um you've done so in a way which i think has been widely recognized as being a positive thing um we're in this new world of talking about mental health as well um do you have, did you feel like a trailblazer when you were doing it did you feel like you you had to talk about it did you feel like it was something you you, you felt obliged to talk about because people had heard about you in the the news or they'd seen you on in different sort of newspapers that's a really good question that mate i think I didn't, I didn't view myself as any kind of trailblazer, you know, because at the time you're going through your personal circumstance, you know, um, the, the majority of my thinking was about survival, it was about health, it was about um, saving and resurrecting my career, you know, that that's when, when the majority of my issues came to the fore, I was still, you know, well entrenched in the game and that was my focus it was my livelihood that was at stake as well as my life so when I think about my first steps in addressing and acknowledging my mental health I was actually standing on the shoulders of people like Paul Merson and Tony Adams you know they were the first ones who I think really kind of uh, broke the dam when, when we're talking about addressing more behaviours as opposed to mental health issues at their time. Uh, because if you look at a generation before that, you've got the likes of, you know, George Best, etc., where they were just seen as rogues, whereas Tony Adams uh, and Paul Merson and the like, I think, brought it into a a realm where you, you're consciously addressing problem behaviour. And then I think the progression of my journey is through a generation where we've actually drawn that connection between problem behavior and adverse mental health so you know i never saw myself as any kind of pioneer but you know as with most things in life it's the self-preservation society you know i i desperately wanted to fix what was going on with me resurrect my career and you know part was a a really huge part of my my own uh, cycle of behavior an old one at least i wanted to redeem myself 
Um, when Cy and I first sat down and talked about football and told us as a project idea, I said, I'll have a chat with Clark. And I, I literally spoke for 10 seconds and you went, yep, sign me up. <laughs> like, did, that's, and, and, that's the power that you have mate. Well, well, that's, that's the draw that you have maybe so but, but, but I mean when we've spoken before about uh, depression suicidal thoughts and, yeah. and the, your experience there um, but we, we're going to focus on, on gambling for this series of, of football untold and, and, and the experience of players within the game when, we're not going to do it in a way which is sort of naming and shaming players or looking at players who are being banned for gambling and that sort of the, the tabloidization of, of this as a story but actually what's, the, what's really going on what's, yeah. what's that untold side of of, of the game if you like from a from a footballing point of view and from a gambling point of view problem gambling mm-hmm. what's that starting point where we put a capital p on a problem <sighs> <laughs> it, I, the reason why i was so passionate about joining the, this project is because i know that every individual story will be very very different and one person's addiction is another person's slightly problematic behaviour is another person's mode of entertainment. And we need to understand that en- entire s- spectrum. Um, I wanted to contribute because because of my earlier experiences around the um, consequential outcomes of my gambling, I had demonised the act itself. So because in some of my earlier, you know, forays into into gambling, I did it with that, um, you know, almost obsessive compulsive nature that defined my life. You know, that that uh, that need to to win, to be the best, to accumulate the most. It drove a lot of my gambling behaviours when I first started to engage with gambling and invariably you know the the outcomes were more in the house's favor than my own and then it's the consequences of that that i had to deal with that first highlighted that i might have a problem you know you you get to uh, you have a millionaire's weekend after payday uh, and all of a sudden you've got three weeks of 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 life to live without any money but therein lies a huge part of the problem mick when you're playing football and, and you know you've got a regular income decent contract you're in that you know that superstar mentality that it's going to go forever and you're invincible i was only ever skint for 3 weeks and it would come in again and it would it, you know I, I would have the <clears throat> means to go again uh, and with that mindset of redemption of wanting to you know maybe i think the house owes me now so i'm on that dynamic uh, and it's just self perpetuating and then there are wider ram, uh, you know, parameters around it where if I needed to or I felt I needed to gamble in that three week period, I'm surrounded by peers who have got plenty of disposable income who know that I'm good for it within three weeks time. You know, a percentage of them are joining in those behaviours themselves. They're facilitating company within what they want to do. So, you know, is the, the environment around me facilitated the action and. Um, and then another layer outside of that, especially in the Premier League boom, uh, and when um, you know gambling companies started to become club sponsors, you get targeted and identified, uh, and presented with all these promotional things, and you know we're going to give you you know five hundred pounds worth of free bets, and you're like oh happy days, and it, it, you know the introduction is lovely, but then you're already starting on that, on that that pathway to get in engaged with the behaviour. But when I first identified that it was a problem to come in a very long-winded way, back to your question, um, it was actually when I was injured in 2001. I had a career-threatening injury, a knee injury, and um, I was living above a bookies in Acton. Uh, yeah, that doesn't help, but, this, <laughs> but it goes to show... Oh, but that's it. It goes to show the generation that I'm from. You know, it was back at the bookies when the bookies was that smoky, seedy place, you know, with all the uh, all the uh, cigarette, because you could smoke inside. My goodness, you probably don't even know that, do you? Too Sam, young for that. Sam, you I could don't smoke know inside at one point. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and the, the, everything around the bookies, um, it, it was, it was stigmatised. It wasn't somewhere that you wanted to be seen frequenting. 
You know, it was like the flat cap guy with it with his whippy and blah blah blah. So for me as a young professional footballer, I never wanted to be seen there. But what I found when I was um, when I was injured and I, I had no ability to do this game that I love, I had all this time and I needed something to focus my attention on to take my thinking away from the potential loss of my career. I wholly engaged myself in being in the book bookies from nine to five and then from there going to the casino from five to nine because it wasn't for the purpose of gambling it was for the purpose of um, engaging my mind in something other than my fears and emotions about my current situation so i i, I and again it is it's one of the i think one of the fallacies that i had about my my own actions in the past i believed i was a gambling ha- uh, addict just like i believed that i was an alcoholic but they were the symptoms of my problem my problem was my psychological and emotional self management and regulation and what i was doing i was an expert in a, emotional avoidance I was brilliant at, at running away and engaging my mind in something that was inconsequential. And for a period of time, a long period of time, it was gambling. What was the thing that made you, if you go into a bookmaker's at nine o'clock in the morning, what was the thing that made you not leave at 10 o'clock in the morning or at 12? What was the thing that made you stay till five and then made you think, oh, actually, well, 5 p.m. now I can go. So what was the thing that made you not go home and say, that's enough for me today? Uh, again, this is an, another thing that I want us to bring to, to this issue is oftentimes we look for single strand solution, single strand reason for, you know, for actions, for behaviours, for outcomes, multi-layered. So when I get in there, I'm, I'm, I might win on the first few dog races and I like that. You know, it's a nice feeling, especially in a period where I'm feeling less than and suboptimal. So, I'll, you know, I want to win a bit more. I might lose a couple. I might lose three or four and now I'm starting to calculate my budget and what I've got to work with and now I need to win a few more. So, you know, the, the it's, a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where, when you, um, you have an emotional investment in the action and my emotional investment was to make me feel better than my current living situation and whether it was winning, which gave me, you know, the joy and the pleasure of winning, but you've got to remember because I'm, I'm earning a decent living, There was no amount that was going to be enough. I'm not going to go into the bookies and come out with a life-changing amount. So there's never a cap on it. But if I'm losing, I need to recoup that. I need to redeem myself. So it fulfills itself again. I need to put those bets on until the last possible, you know, moment when the decision is taken away from me. People maybe might go, well, he's a footballer, so he's trained to win, if you like. He, he, he obviously wants to win no matter what. Um, have you sort of explored in yourself what were those starting points that meant you always wanted to be up, that you always wanted to be the best version, that you want to be the best person in the bookmaker, if you like? I've, ex- I've explored it extensively in therapy, uh, and my experience will differ greatly to others, but I would advocate and recommend that everyone goes through therapy to understand their core beliefs and values what are your drivers in any given situation because just like i said about uh, drinking and gambling very different actions but my drivers uh, to do them were all born out of the very same you know feeling and, and thought process for me it started as a kid you know I, I really needed that positive affirmation from from my dad it, it was that external validation that i needed and it came in success and then being a, 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 a minority ethnicity in a, a widely white community, in a widely white school, it was about acceptance. I needed to do things to make you accept me and be my friend. And what worked was being successful. If I was the best player on a team, if I scored all the goals, if, if I aced all the tests, people came to me and they accepted me and they wanted to be my friend. So... Everything about achieving and being successful, to me, underpinned my self-esteem and my my, uh, my validation. You go into football, it's exacerbated. Because I get into football at 14, 15, 16 years of age. And once you sign an apprenticeship, especially, what you think of yourself is utterly irrelevant. What you're, At 16 and 17, when you first get to a professional club as an apprentice, 
what you think of your abilities, of your playing style, of your identity, utterly irrelevant. Unless you do and become what that coach thinks, unless you do and become what that manager thinks, you're not even going to get on the professional ladder. So for another two years, all of this external validation seeking is compounded because now my potential livelihood is on the line. And then I get that professional contract and it's exacerbated even further because now I've got the contract. It's only the manager's opinion that matters and the fans. And the fans' opinions are important because once I leave the training ground, once I leave the, the stadium, that the illusion of ownership within football means that fans, especially nowadays with social media, feel that they, they have the right to appraise, assess uh, and you know abuse you no matter what the time of day, no matter what the location. So uh, I don't want to be abused when I'm going out for Sunday lunch with my family. You know, I don't want the newspaper to say I was four out of ten because six million people will read that who haven't been to the game, who will subsequently think that I was shy. So everything about me is external validation. And in order to get good external validation, I need to be the best. I need to be winning. I need to be seen to be at the pinnacle. And that, you know, it's a it's a behavioural cycle and a thinking process that, that it manifests itself in all areas of your life unless you become conscious of it and when and how you do it there's um is there a is there a perceived logic to the idea well i won these i won this money i won on the first three so actually now i'm losing i need to have the solution or i've got the solution because i've already seen it earlier this morning to win it back there's almost like a control thing there it feels like you're still in control although most people always say it's all the house will always win if you like but i wonder whether or not there was something in that this idea that you always felt or there's an element where you think well, I'm still in control of this situation. It's not getting away from me, even though from the outside you might go, hang on a minute, money's being lost here multiple times. Is there is there still a feeling that I can I can win this round? I'm I'm, I'm a professional footballer. I'm I'm set to win. I'm successful. I could I can beat the system if you like. If you want in to to be you know analogous with, with with football, every time I went to the casino, it was like a match. So I go through blah 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 blah. Do good things in in the game, do bad things in the game. The outcome outcome is what I've got no points or three points, but that's only one match in the course of a season. <laughs> you know, I'm playing the long game with a cast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I if I go home and I've lost that game, then it's all right because tomorrow's another game. You know, I can go again. But that's that being said, that's not my core thinking when I'm going into it. You know, um, it, I, now this it, it sounds almost contradictory, but there's an element of being out of control that's actually liberating. There's an element, this is my, my experience, you know, there, there's an element of things being down to the turn of a card, the push of a button. That, that's, that, that totally um, kind of abdicates me of uh, uh, any responsibility. It's nothing to do with me. So if I win or lose here, it's not my fault. It's the cards. It, it, it's the wheel. It, it's it's lady luck. You know, it's whatever you, you want to put on that. So, um, and the reason why I, I mentioned that is because I've identified that that was the reason why I drank to the excess that I did as well. I didn't love alcohol. I, I, what I loved was that moment where you feel that full release of, of responsibility, that, that weight of having to be accountable there's a point in alcohol where I, I don't care anymore. And I loved that moment and I needed that to self-perpetuate. So, uh, and you bring that into, into gambling. There are moments in there like that as well. So, you know, you can sit there. It's, I could sit in a casino and I could lose just an arbitrary sum, let's say a thousand pounds. And I could absolve myself of the responsibility of that because it was the cards. You mentioned no alcohol there. There comes a point where you're drinking, where you you drink so much you pass out. What were those stop points? What were those moments where you could go, that's enough for me now? Did they did they not exist? Because, you know, eventually you, you drink so much you fall over. You know, that, that you you can physically push yourself so far. Gambling, though, you've you've said financially you, you were you were kind of coping or you would you knew you were good for it or you could be, you know, lent that money. So were, were there stop points? Were there moments where you thought that's enough now? Uh, I think this is one of the 
reasons that that I can draw my experiences away from someone uh, who will wholeheartedly say they are a full on gambling addict in as much as my stop points were, were pretty natural. If I've run out of money, I've run out of money and um, I would go home, I'd lick my wounds. Uh, the next day, I might, like I said, I might borrow some money to try and go again. But invariably, it was always in amounts that I could, you know, uh, uh, reimburse people or repay them or in amounts that I could hide from, you know, from my family or, or, or my wife. And once you get into that cycle of, of borrowing and repaying and borrowing and repaying, um, it, it's incredibly difficult to get out of. It's incredibly difficult. And the the greatest uh, difficulty about it for me is the amount of headspace that it takes. It, your bandwidth on a daily basis, it, it it's filled with, right, who have I borrowed from? Who do I owe? What have I said to them? What have I, why have I not paid that bill? And what was the reason I gave? What does, what does my wife know about that? Well, you know, why did I borrowed that money? And every day, when you're at home, you should be in your sanctuary. You should be able to relax. You should be able to switch off. But when you're gambling, especially in this modern era where it's on your, it's on your smartphone, it's on your tablet, it is all consuming. You know, because if I am in debt, if I can't pay the mortgage or a bill, I can't let my wife know that because it will shed light or expose, you know, my, my actions or the reasons for it. So instead of relaxing at home, I've actually got the best mask on that I've ever had and the biggest because this is the person who knows me intimately. It's easy for me to put a mask on for you, Mick, when I see you in the street. Oh, come on, do this, that or the other. I'm not going to see you, you know, for another six days, for another three months. But my partner knows me intimately. So I have got to be an Oscar winning actor to show them, to show her that there's no problem. So that's 24-7, every interaction, every response, you know, I'm analysing, am I giving away my little secret? But fed into that, if you're still in the cycle of how I, I, I was, where I need to redeem myself, I need to win this back, not only are you pretending to them when you're there, you're actually making little excuses to sneak off. And do you know what? I'm going to sit in the car for half hour and I might be able to log on here and I might, you know, oh, I'll tell you what, if I, um, we, we're going for, we're going out for a meal tonight. So if I put a few ackers on for the football, then, you know, I can, I can, I can relax knowing I've got my bets on and my chance to win. But when we are at dinner, I'm like, what are the scores? What are the scores? Oh, love, I'm just going out for a smoke. What are the scores? What are the scores? You know, it is all consuming of your bandwidth, of your mental bandwidth, which reduces your capacity and capability to do the very fundamentals that got you there in the first place. And one of my biggest problems for, for a period in my career was my inability to train properly because of the, you know, the, uh, the effects and the psychological effects of gambling. This podcast is sponsored by NHS Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care Board and Beacon Counselling Trust. If you'd like to reach out, visit beaconcounsellingtrust.co.uk. I, I think it's really interesting that because that idea that you, you paint a picture really well of, of how you were gambling and the, the affordability of that gambling. But actually what you've touched on there is that, that sense that it almost changed, even though that was something, I'm not going to say that was in control because obviously there were elements that were spilling out, but it there's an element of it which changes the sort of person that you are. The sort of person who then doesn't tell your wife the truth mm -hmm. is a very different person to someone who goes and has a couple of bets on the, the, the footy on a, on a Saturday afternoon. And I wonder whether or not actually that aspect of it is the thing that people might relate to a lot, where they suddenly go, it's not just about the gambling anymore. It's about that, as you said, who knows what? What yeah. do I tell them? What have I told them? How am I going to explain that there's no money in that account anymore and, exactly that. and that, that must make you raise questions about what sort of person you are what sort of husband you are uh and and those sorts of uh avenues as opposed to am i an addict is this a problem it, it attacks your your fundamental identity and value of self because just like you you've uh, you've articulated there you become the person that you never wanted to be deceitful lying um you know hiding uh, uh, from either social interactions, working interactions, or various responsibilities. 
within your day. Uh, it you, it undermines your, your capacity and your ability to be present for your children, which, which undermines my value as a father. You know, I'm, I'm not providing for them, and I know it's because I'm doing this, which undermines my own personal value of, of, of what I should be doing for my kids. Uh, every... Every negative aspect of it destroys your sense of self according to who you want to be. If you're built like I am psychologically. That's what it did for me. Um, one of the toughest things that, that I've had to deal with about my gambling behaviours, uh, and you, you asked about the point when, it, when did it become a problem P. It's when you slip off that income scale that you thought you were going to be on a perpetual incline. So I left uh, Burnley. Uh, I was on eight, eight, eight or nine grand a week when I was at Burnley. Um, I left there and I went to um, York City. I went on loan to Preston, came back, went to York City on a thousand pound a week, which is a wonderful sum of money. 50 grand a year is a great job. But that drop from 400 grand a year to 50 to fifty grand a year, you know, when you do have, you, you know, the, the size of mortgage, the, the the family and the children and the cars and everything, the, the style of living that you've been accustomed to and believed you were going to be in forever, now I need more money. I fundamentally need more money to exist. So rather than it becoming, um, you know, just a cycle of, of engagement or disengagement behaviour, now it becomes a fundamental requirement that I'm successful in order to continue to live my life in the way that I'm accustomed to. And that's when it became a P with a cap a problem with a capital P for me, because my funds I couldn't pay at the end of the month if I'm borrowing from you, and so now I'm borrowing from Sam to pay Sai. Uh, and then I'm borrowing from Pete to pay Sam to so, to pay, uh, and you get into this cycle and cycle and cycle uh, until the amount of your debt is, is far more than you're going to earn over a period of time. And because of that, in my experience, I started to gamble larger amounts. It, it sounds uh, it it sounds counterintuitive, but it, it seemed logical that if I bet bigger, I'll win bigger. And being someone who, who's all, you know, consistently a, a, um, experienced su success, I, I expected it to happen. And then it gets to a point where the, the amount that I've lost, I can't borrow off anyone anymore. I, the amount that I've lost, I can't get a loan from a bank for anymore because my banking history is so erratic that my credit scores through the floor. You know, we're talking about get, getting TV license payments bounced back of like £13 a month or whatever it is, and let alone the mortgage for whatever size that was. So my whole banking and credit history is going through the floor. I've got no projected income that's going to fix th this current situation. Now I'm starting to understand that I, I'm, I'm in shit street. Uh, and that's when things escalate beyond logic in my opinion. You start to borrow bigger sums because you can't go from the standard institutions or you're kind of going to this dodgy person over here or someone who I don't really know over there and these sums are getting bigger. Uh, and Are the lies getting bigger at that point as well? Of course they are. The lies are huge because back at home you're still playing, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses and, and everything's absolutely fantastic. You're trying to pretend to to your family that, that everything's okay but you know the irony is the when you get into that point your family knows everything's not okay especially your partner you know that they, they, they and unless you you you're being secretive about the actual accounts and statements and stuff like that you know it is it's clear to them that you your car ran out of petrol for the third time this month oh i, I just missed the petrol station when really you you know you had actually got no money and I had to wait for my brother to come out and lend me fifty quid and fill the car, you know these th these lies get so uh, entrenched and ridiculous that you can't hide from them anymore. But one of the, the the greatest problem with it all about me and one of the greatest difficulties in recovery and wellness is if you've taken your gambling to that level 
I believe I'm fortunate because I never, I never borrowed astronomical sums of money. I borrowed large sums of money, but never astronomical. But when you do decide to turn a corner uh, and you're like, right, I've had enough of this. I need to do something different. I need to turn a corner. It's not like stopping drink or drugs. You know, you stop drinking, you feel the physical benefits within days. You, you feel that your time open up, you know, with immediately you stop dr uh, drugs or whatever. When you stop gambling, your debt is still there. Your standard level of income is still what it was. So you might get, you know, three months, six months down the line where you've been behaving perfectly. You've not engaged with anything, you know, you've really, your drive has been to not engage with anything. But your employment situation is the same, your bills are the same, so your debts are the same. And you're still pretty deep in that, in that hole that you've dug. And, you know, you don't see any reward for that commitment and effort. Now, I don't know if others will see it like I do, but, you know, my whole life had been based on work and reward. It's work and reward, and especially in football, that reward's immediate. You play well, you get three points. You know, you have a good season, you you, you, you get promoted, you, you get a new contract. All of the things are immediate. When I've come into Civvy Street, I've noticed that working then, the responses aren't even immediate. You know, you, you're working in a, in a standard organisation, you produce a project or whatever, they don't get back to you for six weeks. And for those six weeks, I'm awaiting validation, I'm awaiting outcome. So in a very similar vein, you know, to someone with my my pre prior mind cycles, when, when I stop gambling, I want my immediate rewards. I want that acknowledgement, you know, that I'm good now. I'm doing good. I'm out of this situation. But it doesn't work like that. And that's one of the hardest things, I think, to navigate where with gambling in the whole area is that that disparity between your decision to change your actions in your life and the actual practical benefits of changing your actions in your life because somewhere in that ground there are multiple opportunities for you to slide back down. Absolutely. And actually, that's one of the things when we talk about people getting help and support, that actually, that, that there's that network and understanding about what that journey will feel like and look like on, almost on a day by day basis. You mentioned that, 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 that turn, you, you touched on turning the corner there. Do you remember the day you turned the corner? Was there a moment, was there a thing where you went, enough? Something needs to change now. Was there, a, was there a thing that happened? Was there a moment? Was there a conversation that happened that, that you thought, right, now is the time to start accepting where I'm at? Uh, there was a distinct moment, and it would be very different to everyone else's. Uh, and my distinct moment were, was when I put myself in front of a lorry at 60 miles an hour. When you, were, when you try to take your own life, <laughs> there, there is no clearer example of, I have had enough of this. I had had so, so enough that I, I did not want to be here anymore. Um, so th that's the clearest point that things were uh, were at the point, were at the stage where I had had enough. But that's a very different point from where I started to see huge changes and gains in my behaviour. And, and this is where I think I'll probably differ from, from others. Um, and it, it kind of... You know, it explains my standpoint on things like drink and gambling. Is that my my attitude and my approach to the whole gambling experience didn't change until I was about six months into therapy, six months into cognitive analytical therapy, because C A T. Prior to that, and it was the same with alcohol, I demonised the action, and it was the action that was wrong. So if I ever engaged in it, I judged myself for engaging with the action instead of trying to understand what what my motivations were behind engaging with the action. It was only when I got to about six or seven months uh, deep into CAT that I understood that it was my thinking and my motivations that were the important things that needed to change. It was my responses in emotional situations or in traumatic situations that needed to change. Uh, I needed to understand that 
if I was to go out for a meal with, with my wife and we had a glass of wine each, that's awesome. We were socialising. We're, re we're relaxing. If I have had a terrible day uh, and she doesn't have a clue what's going on and I can't see any, any, you know, any light over here and I need to go and get battered, that's not okay. I, I, you know, the, my motivation to drink was to escape or for distraction or emotional situational avoidance. And it's the same with gambling for me. But I didn't understand that. So if there's a sweepstake at work and I'm putting my two quid in with everyone else, uh, uh, you know, on, on the Grand National, happy days, social, uh, you know, activity. If like, just like I said, I, I, you know, there's something going on in my life. My father passed a year ago to uh, a year ago, uh, which was, you know, one of the greatest tragedies of my life. And if in that moment, I was like, oh, I need to go to the casino. That's not the driver. That you know, if I'm going to the casino in that mood, the way I'm going to interact with it is going to be to the nth degree uh, for consequential outcome. I can't do that. Um, but you know, the I always like the the positive aspect of it. The proof in the pudding. We always talk about working on your wellness and your mental health, and it's quite ethereal, isn't it? You know. But the proof in the pudding is my father did pass a year ago. It was unexpected. And Mick, at no point was it ever dangerous for me. And that shows the outcome of the work that I've done. You know, at no point was, was I, you know, on, on a three day bender, either at a casino or in a pub. At no point was I sat on a bridge. You know, I, I managed the situation and my emotions uh, in the new ways that I'd learnt. And that, I believe, is what people need to hear and know, is that it can change. From someone who's been at the very edge of the precipice of life, as low as you can possibly go, I got to that, possibly the worst situation in my life, and I managed it, not, not just effectively, but productively. This is the moment, Clark, where you get the validation from the gents in the room. I mean... I know yeah, you've been, uh, been mesmerised by, by what you've been listening to. Say how it started. Yeah, same for me. So powerful, that Clark. I mean, everything's so relatable to myself. I'm sure the listeners and, and Sam can speak after me, but you've articulated it brilliantly. Um, all of them emotions, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I'm, it's like looking in the mirror, listening to you there. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. I'm, we're nodding away, obviously. And that that was just so powerful. It was excellent. And I, I see so much of myself within that, the validation the, the exhaustion of telling lies and the deceit. Um, I used to always be amazed at coming home with that, but how quickly the next morning I'd bounce back and I'm going to win again and I'm going to beat the system. That, you know, Mick saying when's enough enough and you'd go and especially the phone thing, we, we talk about it, GA, people still years, years without a bet, putting their phone in their pocket and sneaking around and taking it to the toilet and those tiny things that would seem alien to anyone else. But um, yeah, really, really related to that. And I thought it was excellent. Thank you, Claire. For me, listening to everything you were saying there, it's a lot of it's escapism from what's going on in your head because you're overthinker like a lot of us are. So your times, maybe drinking episodes, gambling episodes, it's to escape all these things going on in your head. Um, I want to ask you a question. So now we all have bad days. So... How do you deal with a bad day now or a bad, it might not just a bad episode or something bad in your day that's negative. How do you deal with that now? It's uh, a brilliant question, Sam, because I, I've, it, it evolves. You know, initially what I, I used to do, um, a lot of my frustrations, my acting out frustrations were um, when I used to feel like I'm doing so much for everyone else what do I get to do for me? Where's my time? You know, and I, I would use that as motivation to go on a bender, to go to the cast. Why mm. is my time? Uh, it was it was me time, you know, but was it constructive and productive? Usually not because of that motivation. So what I had to do initially was I had to diarise me time every day. And it, it, invariably it came at 10 o'clock at night and I, I'd smoke a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Not a crack pipe, <laughs> I don't, just a, a cherry tobacco or something like that. And I'd smoke a pipe and, pipe and I'd take half hour for myself. Um, 
But knowing that I had that later in the day, we used to be able to offset small emotional spikes. Um, and then it got to a point where, you know, there are times when I need more than that. So I'll go into golf a little bit. Mm. You know, I'd go for a round of golf. I'd, I, I didn't go for the social. I'd like to go on my own and go on a stomp round the course, do 18 holes in two and a half hours, you know, and just spend that time on my own in the open air. And what I really... So, okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I'd do that. And then lockdown happened and I couldn't play golf. And I felt like I was without. And I was like, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do now? So what I used to do, um, and it was off the back of therapy again, rather than thinking that I've lost the action, I would go through and find out what it was that that action gave me that I really liked. And there were two things that golf gave me that I really liked. One was I didn't have my phone on for three hours. And the other was that I was outside and uninterrupted. So now when I get, you know, big emotional spikes or periods of trauma, uh, one of the first things I'll do to, you know, to with, with my wife, I'll say, right, at some point today, I need to go out for an hour. Just go, you know, go for a nice walk, go for a long stomp or something. If it's not as large as that, then I'll say, I need my 10.30 tonight. You know, I need my half hour. I need that something to look forward to because I know that in that moment I'm going to get half hour to be able to reflect on what's happened during that day and it's only because I've been able to address my thinking cycles so rather than ruminate on them whenever I had time to myself in the past I would think something through a million times come to a million different answers and believe them all you know so I'd be so confused whereas uh, now when I get my half hours rumination or, or, or hours bit of meditation whatever you want to call it I'll have a thought um, and I, I I ask myself what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario and the likelihood is it will be somewhere in between. And once I've come to those conclusions in my own head, I share it. Okay. So I'll share it with either my wife, I've got a counsel with my wife, my brother, my old man who sadly passed, uh, my therapist, my eldest daughter. Between those five people, I've always got someone I can share something with. Because you know how it is. Sometimes it might be about your missus. It might be about your brother, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, I cycle it through. I get objectivity. I take time for myself. They're my three fundamentals. Yes. Can I just ask you a quick one on the validation? Yeah. Uh, do you still have that urge for the validation? I really recognise that. And if so, how do you deal with that? I do still have that validation. Um, I do. No, let me self-correct. I still have that initial intrusive validation thought. Okay. So let's say I walk past someone in the street and, uh, and they look away. I'm like, oh my gosh, they did, what did they think of me? You know, they, mm -hmm. were they judging my clothes? And then I give myself a counter thought. I'll be like, or they maybe just thought that they've missed something. You know, I, I give myself a counter thought to that first intrusive thought that that require validation. Um, when it's in something a little bit more ve meaningful, I ask myself what that person's opinion means to me. Okay. You know, because invariably validation comes from an interaction with a person. So, you know, say me and Mick didn't get on well today and, and I'm running it through. I'm like, well, what does that actually mean in the grand scheme of my life? Is, is Mick on the list of five opinions that actually validate me. Mm -hmm. Do you have that list? Do you have <laughs> Am that I list on that list? Your, no. Uh, no, in, I, I, in I understand your point In the point context there, no. of my life, no, no. absolutely. But in the context of maybe future employment, maybe. So you're probably on the list, but you're not at the top of my list that gives me my sense of self-worth. You know, um, what Mick thinks, what you guys think of me today is not going to cause me to change my overall life behaviour. Or but it might give me some insight into what I do future in podcasts, what I talk about. Whereas if it was the opinion of my mum or my wife or one of my children, that's an opinion I'll consider when it comes to addressing my core values and beliefs and beliefs. So you do have a active list of just family, friends? Do you, do you actively have that list of five, the, six? Or? There are only two other people outside of, of my family members um, who's opinions i consider one okay. is my therapist who, who is one of the greatest people i have ever met i never thought that i would be able to resonate with uh 
you know, a, a, a 60 odd year old white Liverpudlian guy. Um, but on so many levels, we connect. And, you know, he's, he's proved that over, over the course of 18 months. And, and his opinion is very valuable to me because he has that insight. Uh, and other than that, he's my best friend. Um, and even their opinion, I take with a pinch of salt sometimes. Because your best friend is always invested in your happiness as opposed to your wellness. And what I've seen uh, is when we, when we talk about things with friends, they'll often use distraction techniques. They'll say, oh, don't worry, or minimising techniques. It's not as bad as, it, you know, at least it's not like, oh, don't worry about, you know, let, let's let's go out and, and we'll... So it's distraction and minimising as opposed to actually addressing the point that you brought to the table. So okay. my list is family and my therapist. So if these four people that you validate in your life, obviously close family members, have an opinion that's maybe of a negative proposition to you, what do you do you just cancel it out or what what's the process behind that? Because obviously we don't always cope well to that. And it might be honest. It might be right this, this and this. But it's like, well, that's not really very positive where we sort of need that sort of positiveness around us sometimes i totally hear you and my wife and i especially have developed almost this kind of process where when we're speaking open and honestly to each other it's not an immediate response scenario yeah. it's not an immediate back and forth it'd be like if i bring something and then well, no invariably if she brings something to me then i'll say okay thank you look i'll get back to you that yeah. i'll get back to you on that so i'll go and have a think about it and I'll come to her and I'll bring my honesty, honestly held opinion about it. Now, if it continues to differ, then only because we're both being through therapy, we know the cycle. Okay. You know, so if it's an action, we'll be like, well, why am I doing that action? What What do I see as the benefit? Uh, and who am I doing it for? And is what I see, it, what I think is the benefit might be totally different to how you're perceiving it. And if those two are different, if you you know if that's where the the disparity is, then we need to understand each other's motivations. Um, one of the greatest changes and improvements we made in our relationship was not judging the other, or uh, for something that we hadn't already articulated our our value or belief about. You know, you can't tell me off for not doing something when you haven't told me that it's something you want me to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or you, uh, or you can't uh, on the outcome of an event. If it's something that you're invested in, talk to me, and we'll do something about it. But what, one of the hardest things to come to terms with is criticism from people you love. Um, I know that that my wife unconditionally loves me. She's not saying or doing anything to undermine me. So there must be, you know, there's some value in us discussing where it's come from. Because oftentimes, you know, it, it can be from their background and history and values and beliefs. Everyone brings their history into a relationship. You know, sometimes I might do something that might remind my wife of her old man. It's not to do with me, you know, but unless we talk about it and bring that to the front, then, then I can't tell her to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Clark, thank you so much for being so, so honest. I know you're sticking around for, uh, for Football Untold as well. Uh, I think, you know, the personal side of the story from your point of view, I think absolutely... Um, it's worth sort of listening to. I'm sure people will listen again to this conversation as well. You're more than welcome to do that if you're listening to Football Untold as well, as well as the football inside of things. We'll also be looking at the, the personal impacts of it as well. And and obviously what what the future can can be about. In future episodes, we'll look at how that sort of dressing room culture uh, is, is part of this issue and, and, and the lads' experience within the dressing room of gambling within the game. Uh, thanks to Sai and to Sam. We'll have more from Football Untold. Uh, thanks so much to Clark Carlisle for his story as well and all the contributors. Don't forget you can subscribe to the podcast now and drop your social media messages using the hashtag Football Untold. This podcast is sponsored by NHS Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care Board and Beacon Counselling Trust, promoting an open discussion about gambling-related harm and the destruction it can cause. If you've been affected by anything you've heard and would like to reach out, visit beaconcounselingtrust.co.uk. Let's keep talking.